from the heart of Wrexham. Welcome to the Hope Street Church Podcast. For more information of how to get involved, stay tuned until the end of the episode. So, Brada Pau, good to be with you here today. If we haven't met, my name is Trias Parry. I'm part of the Tabernacle team. Yes, Tabernacle. Um, We serve you coffee from Tuesday to Saturday and pastries. Please tip your waiter. Um, I'd actually like to invite um, Harry and Gabby just up to the stage really quickly, if that's okay. Um, And team, if you could pop that scripture on the screen, that'd be amazing. Yeah, give them a round of applause. So we are very blessed to have a multicultural, multilingual church. Um, And so I've invited our friends up here to read a bit of scripture with us. So this is Psalm 40 up on the screen. The top is the message. I'll read out in the English and then I'll pass to my friends here. I waited and waited and waited for God. At last he looked. Finally he listened. He lifted me up out of the ditch, pulled me from deep mud. He stood me up on a solid rock to make sure I wouldn't slip. Ar ôl disgwyl yn frwd i'r agwydd neu'r rhywbeth, dyma ben troi atau i. Roedd wedi gwrando ar na un gweiddi am help, cododd fi allan o'r pwll leidiog ar mwd trwchus, rhoddodd fy'n rhaid ar y graig a gwneud yn siŵr fy mod i ddim yn baglu. El Señor espere pacientemente, y él se inclinó a mí y oyó mi clamor. Me sacó del hoyo de la destrucción, de lodo senagoso, Asentó mis pies sobre una roca y afirmó mis pasos. Give him a round of applause. Ufa, ufa, Ua. fuego. So I will explain a little bit why we did that later. But the word is living and breathing, and there is power in having someone speak the word of God from the language of their heart. Look, I'm a massive grump. I am, 100%. Like, I know I come across as pretty chirpy and like, smiley, smiley, but inside, it it ain't a story. Um, Basically, if anything is a few degrees away from what I need it to be, I get really grumpy. I'm awful. I am on the neurodivergent scale. I do like things to be just so. And if things are a little bit off, I don't like it. For example, the geekiest superpower that nobody wants I have is I can be walking down the street, minding my own business, and I lose my peace. Something is wrong here. And I'll look around and try and work out what it is, and it will be that there is an apostrophe out of place on a sign that I pray for me, man. Like, it's just, it's unnecessary. Or if I walk into a room that I frequent on a regular basis and things are a little bit off, that's what happens inside. Or someone jumps in front of me in a queue. (laughs) Yeah. Which, basically, I don't like feeling frustrated. I don't like feeling tension. So my life is very simple. Same clothes, same food, same rhythm, same routine. It gives me peace. But the awkward turtle is, sometimes me wanting to stay peaceful and safe and neat and tidy means that I shield myself from the mess and I shield myself from the needs of others. Ever felt that way? Want to keep your life nice and tidy? The thing is, life is lived in the messy middle. Life is lived in the tension. And we find that in today's psalm, which I love. We've been going through a journey through the psalms as a church in this series called Living Life from the Front Line. Well, what is living life from the front line? Well, this psalm shows us exactly what it is. It's flipping messy. In this psalm, right at the beginning, we have what's called an action prologue. So a little bit like Saving Private Ryan. You've sat there, you've got your popcorn, you're nice and comfortable, and boom, you're in the middle of a battle. This is exactly what's happening at the beginning of Psalm 40. In the psalms, David had been waiting patiently. And when we think waiting patiently, we think, you know, sitting, you know, oh God, yeah, fingers crossed, palms together. No, this is an active waiting. This is an expectant waiting. This is, God, if you don't come through, I am completely stuffed. He says, I waited and waited for God. He was stuck in a desolate pit, lying waste in horror and floundering helplessness. I waited and waited, but he doesn't just stay there, right? He swings from desperation, I waited and waited, to celebration, you dropped a heart, you dropped a song in my heart, Lord, to trash talk, may everyone who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. To desperation again, come quick, Lord, would you help me? To humility, I am poor and needy. To confession, you are my help, you are my delight. I'm like, flipping heck, David, it's a bit messy. Like, if David wrote this on his Facebook wall, you'd be sliding straight into the DMs going, you okay, hon? Kiss, kiss. (laughs) 
Actually, to be honest, David's Instagram bio would have been a train wreck, slays giants for lols, likes to hang around in fields, chased around after other men's women, David, um, not against a spot of murder, but at the same time, he was a man after God's own heart. This train wreck? How's that possible? Because he's real. The thing about this psalm is that David is airing his concerns to the Lord from the place of his own victory. His heart leans out to his people at the same time as Israelites thinking, if you've done it for me, you can do it for them. What I love about him is he's not trying to be one of those plastic Christians. How are you? Blessed. How are you, brother? Blessed. How are you? I'm so blessed. He's actually being real. My challenge to us, friends, is in this world of polished personas, can we be the same today for each other? Sometimes God... Zansa may not look like how we imagine. Sometimes it may look like when we pray he didn't intervene. One of the reasons I'm back in this country from Australia was my uncle was suffering from prostate cancer. And um, through COVID, I couldn't leave. And by the time I got back, it was too late. And I prayed and I prayed and I believed that God was going to move. But he didn't get healed. And he died. But my family got healed. And I realized how precious family was. And relationships got restored. And you know, sometimes when you pray, it feels like God doesn't answer. But he does. It just doesn't look always like we expect. Thing is, friends, the more real we are, the more honest we are, the more willing we are to step out of this plastic, pretend everything is awesome Lego land, the easier it is for God to speak to us in the home of our mind, will, and emotions, a.k.a. our heart. In this psalm, David holds the tension of, I know you can do this. I've seen you do this. Your word says so. But, oh, Lord, people are in pain. And you know what? I'm riddled with doubt. Yet I will believe again for me and for the people that I care most about. How flipping real is that, honestly? You know, we talk about Christianity. Oh, you're, Christ you're a Christian. Oh, it's all dialed up and, you know, all perfect and, you know, Sunday best. Heck no, have you seen my life? But the beauty of it is, it's real and we know that without Jesus, there is no hope. The real theme of this psalm is intercession. So what is intercession? Well, the definition in the dictionary is the action of intervening on behalf of another or praying on behalf of another, which is what we do when we pray. Psalm 40 verse 8 says, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. The coolest little plot twist about this psalm that I am just frothing over is that David may well have already been king when he writes this, right? So he's king, he's got all this power, got all this influence, all this authority, and yet where does he get his answer? On his knees. Lord, I don't have anything that I need. Lord, I need you to intervene. So back to intercession. The complication is you may have been part of a church where when we talk about inter intercession, it's kind of read out with the announcements. Um, guys, can we just pray for Steve? Um, yeah, he really needs our prayer. Um, he's got athlete's foot and um, we just really need healing. Not you, Steve Landon. Um, or, Father, can we pray for Ethel? She's had a problem with her toaster and um, it's quite challenging. I've been in that environment and I'm jesting to make a point. But oh, maybe, maybe you've been in an environment where you're more familiar with intercession being accompanied with shouting as loud as you can because the louder you shout, the closer to Jesus, apparently. That's the theology. Um, heaven's pretty far away. Um, contouring your face into a gurn to show that you really mean it. Um, and it can only be done between the hours of one and three in the morning. Or maybe it's a bit of both. Thing is, neither of those are invalid. But it's about our relationship with Christ. Intercession is a word from the Latin for between and go. An intercessor is a go-between who holds one hand towards the love and the power of God and one hand to the breaking world. And says, let me feel, Father, like Jesus. There are practical ways that people in this church intercede. But one thing we can all do when we hear of those in need is carry their burdens to God in prayer. But why bother? A Christian community lives and exists by the intercession of its members for another, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. An incredible Welsh intercessor by the name of Rhys Howells lived and breathed intercession so much, get this, that he is accredited with helping to bring the end of the Second World War through prayer. Just saying. We have to put our desires to one side for a minute. The answer to someone else's prayer could be lying in our intercession. So we're going to spend some time praying for each other shortly. I've got a couple of points that I'm going to share before we do that. My first point is, 
a lot can be lost inside of your colon. No, Sharon, not that colon, mate. This is church. Like, can you just like keep it highbrow for two seconds, mate? On it, pray for Sharon. Hashtag pray for Sharon. Um, so I'm talking about a grammatical colon. Can we just get that um, scripture up on the um, screens again? Psalm 40, verse 1. It's actually a semicolon, but that wouldn't be as funny. Um, I waited patiently for the Lord, semicolon. He turned to me and he heard my cry. So you might look at that and go, prayed, like, mm, boom, poof. There we go, there came the blessing. No, no, but in that colon is the messy middle. In that semicolon could have been weeks, months, years of waiting patiently. Is he going to show up? Lord, you better show up. Lord, I need you. It doesn't always work like one of those vending machines. Often it's in the wrestling that our faith is grown. But in that wrestling, God gave him a God song, it says in the message. What is this God song? Well, some scholars believe that it centers on an area of breakthrough that David had in his life. Maybe God healed his mate for him. Maybe God restored a relationship. Maybe God brought money through the letterbox. Has God ever brought provision in your life? You can pray for blessing for somebody else. Has God ever brought healing in your family's life? You can pray for healing for somebody else. Has God ever brought you a beautiful partner? Pray into somebody else's marriage. In between the diagnosis and the miracle, in between the heartbreak and the makeup, in between the massive financial burden and the windfall, there is Jesus. Intercessory prayer is the exercise of Jesus' victory in the messy middle for the people we love, which brings me to my next point. A bit of a spoiler. Don't you hate it when you're really buzzing about a film and you really want to go and see it and someone's like, oh, don't you just love, you know, in the end when that happens and you're like, oh. I mean, I know we all know that the ship sinks in Titanic, but like, mate, come on. Sorry, if you didn't know that then. I mean, that was 25 years ago now, so catch up. Um, but I'm about to give you a spoiler as well. We win. We won. So when we talk about warring in prayer, it's not, oh, I'm going to make it happen. It's No, no, it's the yes and amen. We're coming into agreement with the fact that God is victorious. We're coming into agreement with the fact that our circumstances, our finances, what's going on at uni, what's going on in our family, might not look great, but we know that the truth is actually God's kingdom. And we get to speak that into being. All we're doing is saying, yes, your will be done. Your kingdom come. Amen to every flipping promise that's in that Bible. And there are a few. The answer to our prayers has nothing to do with how spiro, as we say in Australia, spiritual you are, what we had for breakfast, how hard you push, how loud you shout, whether or not you say things in the right order, whether or not you do the Christian hokey cokey and whatever it is you feel as though you need to do. It has all to do with proximity. Benny Johnson said, so many of us have believed that we need to labor and perform for God so that we might be accepted. But in the kingdom, we start off accepted. It has to do with his will and the position of our heart. David was rapidly imperfect, but what made him a, God, a man after God's own heart was that he repented quickly, he lived humbly, he knew that he wasn't all that, and he inclined his heart toward Jesus. Which means that we can do it. So how do we do it? A great Anglican writer of the 20th century, writing to a friend, said, and I love this, I'm going to spend 10 minutes just thinking about you and Jesus. And I think that's a brilliant definition of intercessory prayer. You just hold the image and sense of a person or situation in the presence of God as if you want to let one seep into another. That is intercession. We pray from our heart. Lots of us can quote scriptures, right? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Hebrews 11, 1. Like we've all, you know, I'm sure lots of people have sung those songs or you revert, you know, you know the words and the words are powerful, but you have to, you loved that, didn't you, Angus? He loved every minute of that. But if it flows through your heart, it's different. The reason I asked people to come up and speak earlier in the language of their heart is because there, are, there is a meaning and a feeling to it. Intercession is done with feeling. And like I said earlier, I don't always like to feel. I like to keep things nicely boxed up. But I'm going to ask you today if you might carry the burden of another. Maybe you're going to choose to pray for someone who winds you up chronic. The Bible does say to pray for your enemies. We have to feel what we confess, friends. We have to feel what we confess. Rhys Howell said there are three levels to intercession. Identification, agony, and authority. Agony doesn't sound super fun, but effectively that we need to allow ourselves to feel what's going on. Can we just put the um, image up? Would that be okay, please? So intercession, really simply, is the who, 
that we're praying for coming through us and allowing us to feel their burden, to sit in that moment, but then to point it to the what. Jesus is every day, all day, interceding on our behalf before the Father. Taking what we have, holding it up to the word of God and saying, God, would you move? We're believing, would you move? And today we're going to do the same with each other. We're going to think of a who. Maybe your who is the church or leaders, or maybe it's someone that you love. We're going to take the attention off ourselves for a little bit, which we don't often do in this world, and we're going to focus on somebody else. Who, heart, what? Really simple. With prayer, we're joining in the rhythms that are already taking place. You don't need to say the right words, or like, how do I do it? Or you don't know what I did last night, Grace. I don't. But that doesn't change God, and that doesn't change his will. So if the band wouldn't mind coming up for a second, um, that would be super helpful. Um, and we're going to go through this together. What I'm going to ask you to do is to think of someone or something in your world that you would like to pray into. Maybe not your challenge, but somebody else's. You might want to pray for the government of Wales, the government of the UK. You might want to pray for the church. You might want to pray for your neighbour. You might want to pray for your friend, your cousin, your classmate. And we're going to hold them in the presence of God. Really simply. We think of the who. We allow ourselves for a moment, not to the point of being overwhelmed. You don't need to be overwhelmed. You might not be a super emotional person like me. That's all right. But to hold that in your heart and feel for a moment what they must feel. And make the prayer real. You know, there's nothing worse than people like, I'll pray for you. Like, how do you remember? Do you write that down? Like, I could never, if, you, if you're not going to pray for me right now, that, that would fall out my head. Um, now we're really going to pray for people, just for a few minutes, nice and easy, regardless of how strong you think your faith is, no matter what's going on for you, your tradition, all of that. God wants to hear what you have to say. So, when you're ready, I want you to think of who it is you want to pray for. Who are you going to choose to hold before the Lord today? Thank you for listening to the Hope Street Podcast. We're a church in Wrexham with a vision to be a people of hope, following Jesus and giving ourselves a way to see Wrexham in you. To find out more, head to our website, hopestreet.church, or follow us on social media.